Welcome to Citizens Climate Radio, your climate change podcast. In this show, we highlight people's stories, we celebrate your successes, and together we share strategies for talking about climate change. I'm your host, Peterson Toscano. Welcome to episode 88 of Citizens Climate Radio, a project of Citizens Climate Education. This episode is airing on Friday, September 29th, 2023. In today's show, you're going to hear from more than a half dozen college students. Lila Powell is back with a good news story. She was an intern with us last September. Today, you will meet three new team members, Karina, Horace, and Lily. You will also learn about the bipartisan carbon fee and dividend program that is spreading to college campuses around the USA. Plus, Tamara Staten has some more climateering for us. Today's topic is burpees and climate. The global climate movement is very much powered by young people. From the Fridays to Future student demonstrations to the 21 young people who sued the U.S. government, you see high school, middle school, college-age students engaged, committed, and passionate about addressing the causes and the impacts of climate change. But how does someone go from being alarmed about climate change to effectively engaging in promoting meaningful solutions? Emily O'Keefe went through the stages from concerned and confused to confident, creative action. I am a student at the College of William and Mary, and I am a passionate climate activist advocating for the carbon fee and dividend, and a volunteer with Citizens Climate Lobby. I started caring about climate change a couple years ago when I got into minimalism and realized uh, it's important to live sustainably and protect the environment. And then I read this book that changed my perspective drastically on what's going on in the world. And it made me question, is climate change actually worse than I had thought? Is it too big to, to solve? I felt very existential about it. And I think that's what led me to take a gap year to hike the Appalachian Trail, which was really awesome just to not think about climate change for like five and a half months, I guess. But then when I got back, now I'm thinking about climate change again, just naturally and thinking about what needs to be done in the world. I got back into that very existential headspace. And I was thinking I want to do something really big about climate change. And I'm just trying to figure out how can I do that? I didn't know of any solid solutions that existed. I was thinking maybe we just need more people with signs saying help save our planet or something. I was talking to a bunch of my friends about the idea of kind of doing like a Greta Thunberg-esque thing with just like a help save our planet sign. And One of those friends is Helen Tiffin, a fellow student at William and Mary College. The three of us sitting at a lunch table and Emily was like, guys, I want to start a social movement. And we were like, okay, girl, you know, and but she was like, no, I'm serious. And so like every single day at lunch, she would come to us with the new things that she's thought about. And she was like, I want people to sit with a sign. And we were like, okay, so let's let's actually like sit down here for a minute and like think like, what would that sign say? Because at first it was very um, like help save the planet. And that doesn't have enough focus. And that would have been dead on day one. Fortunately, Emily kept talking about her evolving idea with others on campus. It worked out so well. I was friends with someone named Philip Ignatoff, one of my closest friends, and he was the president of our Citizens Climate Lobby chapter at William & Mary. He explained the carbon fee and dividend policy to me, and he showed me En-ROADS, the climate policy simulator that shows just how impactful it is. I could not believe that this policy existed, and then it became really clear if there's going to be a large climate movement to focus it on this policy just based on how effective it is. And that's what really drew me in and is keeping me here is just knowing that this is probably the best thing that America can do about climate change. Emily shared the carbon fee and dividend idea with Helen, who also got excited about it. 
While not the silver bullet needed to fix all of our climate woes, they see it as a powerful, robust approach that will significantly address fossil fuel pollution. They basically fell in love with a great idea. Emily explains how the carbon fee works. It makes corporations pay a fee to extract fossil fuels. Say some hypothetical oil rig extracts a little bit of oil, it's going to have to pay a small fee. If it extracts more, it's going to have to pay a higher fee. And if it extracts a lot of oil, it's going to have to pay a really high fee. What this is going to do, this price is going to flow through the economy. So starting at the source, it's going to become more expensive to be the polluter. And then if a company is buying from the polluter, it's going to be more expensive for them. Fossil fuel intensive products that people are buying are going to become more expensive. Okay, I can see how fossil fuel extraction will become more expensive, and that will impact other industries. But I'm worried about individuals and families. How will this policy affect them? It's going to comparatively make fossil fuel intensive items more expensive than non-fossil fuel intensive items. So it makes it really clear to consumers like, oh, I should be purchasing a a car that requires little fossil fuels compared to one that requires a lot just because it's cheaper. That's what's so beautiful about it. There's no trying to convince people to change their values as much as we can say we need to like care about the planet. And and, yeah, I think we should keep saying that. But like at the scale and speed that we need change, what really is powerful at driving behavior is when prices change. Sure, that sounds very effective. Change the price point and industry behavior changes. What about people? Households whose monthly expenses will suddenly shoot up as the cost of fossil fuels are passed down to them through every product they buy. In addressing one problem, aren't you just creating another? Oh my gosh, thank you for reminding me. I totally forgot the dividend part. So, you know, one of the common criticisms about carbon pricing is that it's not equitable because when you start increasing prices, then lower and middle income Americans will not be able to afford these prices. And so what makes this policy so special, one of the most important functions of this policy is the dividend, where all the revenue from the fee is going to get collected and then distributed equally to all Americans. That actually makes it so that the majority of Americans, around two thirds, will actually break even or profit from the money coming back to them in the, this cash back form. Then they have to pay in increased prices. So it's actually a really equitable policy. Like Emily, Helen is a strong proponent of carbon fee and dividend. It is so nonpartisan and it has that wide appeal to all of these people groups. It really is something that we can. All, all agree upon, just across the political spectrum and through so many different communities of diversity, seeing the excitement on people's faces because there is so many ways to get involved. In a moment, you're going to hear some of the creative and effective ways Emily and others have found to get the word out about carbon fee and dividend. Now, taking on an issue as big as climate change definitely can feel overwhelming. Helen provides much-needed perspective. Climate change. It's this overwhelming, all-pervasive problem. But the good news about an all-pervasive problem is that there are so many ways to intervene. It is so interdisciplinary, and there is so much room that people can do to help So first things first would be to make a sign. And if you aren't comfortable with showing that kind of public display, then there are so many other things that you can do. Letting people know as a college student, as someone at these universities, we have so many resources at our fingertips. It is just about finding that and knowing how to mobilize yourself and others to truly make that impact. And of course, if you're not on a university, there are other things you can do too. It's just on campus, these doors are just already unlocked and open. So how have Helen, Emily, and their friends begun to engage in climate work? Well, they made signs. At first glance, I thought, well, that's nice. (laughs) Uh, But their plan is actually brilliant. Yeah, make the poster. People tape it to their laptops, put it on their dorm doors sit with it in public, 
it's this passive protest where if people are interested and want to learn more, they can come up to you and ask. And if you feel like, oh, I just want quiet study time, take it off of your laptop. The impact was felt immediately on the campus of William and Mary and then beyond. It's really created this snowball effect. I go into my conservation class of like 80 people. A third of the class has these signs on their laptop. It's really become on William & Mary campus. We are ground zero. It is about as common in these environmental class spaces as people wearing masks. Like you don't even think twice. When you see it, it's just out there. Truly hard to describe the extent, but we can just go and ask anyone and be like, have you heard or seen the words carbon fee and dividend? And they'll just instantly know it. They will come up to me and be like, I've been looking for this. Like, how, how do I get more involved? It blasted off. So that's when we started doing the presentations at clubs in our classes. That's when we did our giant chalk murals, just knowing your campus location, just to get this spread. We have this beautiful place we call the Sadler Terrace, and it's just this old brick. People always use this space for advertising. So we made the biggest chalk mural. We actually did seven of these every time it rained. This huge expanse of chalk saying, most effective climate policy, carbon fee and dividend. And then we plugged our Instagram. And then the Instagram like shot off. So it started at William & Mary, but then now we have spread to about eight or nine other, other universities even more past that, just people who spot us through our website or our Instagram are also making signs. But as of like home bases, we have eight to nine, just in the one semester and over the summer. Beyond raising awareness, Helen told me how they tied the campaign to direct action. The Carbon Fan Dividend Movement, abbreviated CFD, is a student-led movement supporting carbon fee and dividend that takes place in many different forms. Our most iconic are signs. So just grab a piece of paper, write most effective climate policy, hashtag carbon fee and dividend, and then a bit.ly link. So bit.ly slash write Congress here. That takes you to um, an automatic template to write Congress. And it's really just creating this snowball effect of getting people more knowledgeable about the policy, getting it spread because it is truly the most effective thing that we could do if passed to help stop the climate crisis. It is all about spreading that awareness and that education in whatever whatever form it presents itself. Emily, who first sat wondering what she can do to address climate change, with the help of her friends, has created a solid movement that will outlast her after she graduates. Last semester, I founded the Carbon Fee and Dividend Movement, which is a student-led movement for this policy. We've been working really hard in the background, organizing, especially this summer, strategizing how to spread this movement. It's so exciting. We're actually going to be housed within Citizens Climate Lobby's higher education team. So the movement has a home base, which I think is really important for the longevity of the movement. There have been other carbon pricing movements that have started, but have been challenging to sustain, I think, because they didn't have a home base. So that's a really important aspect of it. Among students in Citizens Climate Lobby, this is something that can be easily taken on. But we are also building our network to other activists. Also, I just like popped my knuckle in the middle of that. We are building our network among other activist networks, young activist networks. For example, something that is really huge, we are going to be partnered with Fridays for Future in advocating for this. You know, they are one of the most well-known networks of young people who care about the climate. This will bring a lot of power to the movement. Something that's also interesting is Citizens Climate Lobby, we have their values and we are optimistic and we care about being nonpartisan or bipartisan. And we want to make sure that as we grow, we continue to embody these values and make them make sure that that is the face of our movement. We truly believe that that's what it takes to to make it work. Here at Citizens Climate Radio, we have been considering what meaningful, effective action looks like. And if you're a college student, 
connecting with the carbon fee and dividend movement may just be the step you're looking for. Emily, how can people find you and get involved? Our main social media is Instagram. So if you'd like to follow us on our Instagram, it is Carbon Fee and Dividend. And we also have a website, which is cfdmovement.com. This has some more resources about if you want to bring the movement to your school, like flyer designs and kind of strategies for doing that. We also have a Slack where we organize the movement at a national level. So if you're someone who wants to, you know, be in contact with people who are organizing the movement, joining our Slack would be great. It's the Citizens Climate Lobby Higher Education Slack. And that Slack is in our Instagram bio and it is also on our website. was Emily O'Keefe and Helen Tiffin from the Carbon Fee and Dividend Movement. I encourage you to follow them on social media. Learn more at cfdmovement.com. That's cfdmovement.com. Now it is time for the Resilience Corner with Tamara Staten. I'm Tamara Staten, CCL's Education and Resilience Coordinator. I'm excited to continue with our newer series called Resilient Climateering Through Crazy Climate Connections. This isn't a series about weather or science or graphs or data, though I might reference a few of those from time to time. Instead, it's a series about things that help us worry less and act more on climate, explored through a lens of playful curiosity. Together, we'll explore how to enjoy what matters so deeply so that we can be as effective as possible for as long as we're needed. Today's topic is burpees and climate, two seemingly unrelated concepts that have quite a valuable connection. I'm not really a fan of burpees, and I'm also not a fan of climate change. But their relationship is much deeper than that simple commonality for many of us. Burpees have two things going for them, the aftermath and the mental stimulation. The fact that I already did them and I made it through even though I wanted to give up pretty much the whole time and the way that they and many other forms of intense exercise open my mind. Doing burpees taps me into possibilities that simply didn't exist in my idea bank before my heart started beating so hard and sweat started dripping down my face. When I'm moving my body, I get ideas, and I actually like them. Maybe my inner critic gets too tired to resist. I think it's the same with climate action. When I'm taking action for the climate, I feel open to possibility and a deeper sense of hope. When I'm sitting around dwelling on the gloom and doom, worrying more than acting, everything feels hopeless. This is not to say that I encourage you to do burpees if you hate them or even any form of movement or exercise, or climate action for that matter, that you don't like. Find something that floats your boat. Find something that lights you up and allows you to feel that sense of aliveness, optimally even in the process of doing it, so that you get that flow of ideas too. I love high-intensity interval training, or HIT. Somehow it seems to fit my personality, in my tendency to go hard and strong for short periods of time, and relish the breaks between the intense action. Maybe for you, it's walking through your neighborhood or running in the park or jump roping. Or maybe you like to mix it up and you try different things throughout the week or the month. But moving our body creates all sorts of endorphins and that can help us feel more alive and at peace simultaneously. And who doesn't want that? Especially for those of us that want to avoid climate burnout. Movement keeps us going, literally. Oh, and one last thing about burpees and other forms of practice for that matter. There are a couple different ways to integrate action into your climateering adventure. You can do something regularly as a type of foundation practice, like doing three sets of 10 burpees every Tuesday and Thursday morning. That might be likened to going to a CCL chapter meeting every month. You might also, or instead, do 10 burpees when you're feeling overwhelmed or stressed out as more of a focus practice in the moment to help improve your mood. That might be like writing a letter to the editor when you find a good article to respond to. Both approaches, foundation and focus practices, 
are incredibly helpful for building resilience. Though you may notice that the more intentional you are about your foundation practices, the less likely you are to need as many focus practices. In our next episode, I'll dive into another set of unexpected climate connections, space and climate. And I don't mean outer space. I'm talking about a sense of spaciousness that doesn't normally get associated with climate change. I'm Tamara Staten with The Resilience Corner. Thank you for listening and for your commitment to progress. To learn more about tools, trainings, and resources for staying strong through the climate challenge, check out our Resilience Hub at cclusa.org forward slash resilience. From there, you can also learn about and register for our upcoming climate camp in October. And until next month, remember this. Find your passion, let it guide you, and you'll do amazing things for the world. Thank you, Tamara. I am so thrilled with the creativity and the enthusiasm you bring to each one of your Resilience Corner segments. The Resilience Corner is made possible through a collaboration with Tamara Staten, Education and Resilience Coordinator for Citizens Climate Education. The Resiliency Hub website is cclusa.org slash resilience. Starting today, you're going to hear some new regular voices on Citizens Climate Radio. For the next few months, I will work with three new team members, Lily Russian, Horace, and Karina Taley. One of their first assignments was to record short introductions for you. Hi, everyone. My name is Lily. I am currently a junior at Trinity College in the U.S. state of Connecticut. I am majoring in political science and minoring in environmental science. From a relatively young age, I always knew I liked science, but then I went to the island school. Island school is a 100-day semester program on the island of Eleuthera in the Bahamas. It's a semester program focused on sustainability and marine biology with a lot of outdoor and wilderness components to it. We woke up every day at 6 a.m. to train for either a half marathon or four-mile swim. We did a seven-day kayak camping trip. Each of us did a 48-hour solo alone on a beach, and our classes consisted of scuba diving and learning sustainable practices. I could keep rambling on about everything we did there because deciding to apply and attend was one of the best decisions of my life. That experience sparked a passion for me. I was so deeply intrigued by the environment and was itching to learn more about how to protect it. A few fun facts about myself. I played the ukulele and was a theater kid growing up. I don't eat any seafood, which started because I hated the smell, but has continued for environmental purposes. And I worked as a preschool teacher this summer. I will end this introduction with a saying that I took home with me from island school. How do you live well in a place? How do you live well in a place? For me, and for many of those at the island school, that phrase raises important questions. How do you live a life that ensures a more sustainable future for our planet? How do you live in a way that is intentional? How do you live in a way that ensures the well-being of both yourself and the environment around you? Hey everyone, this is Horace. I'm an intern for Citizens Climate Radio. I recently graduated from the University of Michigan. I now work as an environmental specialist for senior advocates for generational equity. I enjoy weightlifting, cooking, listening to hip hop, and of course, watching Michigan football. I grew up in Chongqing, China, a municipality that is famous for a dish called hot pot. I play the guzhen, a traditional Chinese wooden instrument. Although I am from China, I attended high school outside of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Aside from my background, I've always felt connected to nature. I love nature. Since primary school, my family had taken me on weekly trips. We always hiked or went on excursions in nature. I witnessed the majesty of mountains, the magnificence of waterfalls, and the vitality of wildlife. Even scenes as simple as the transparent sky, rustling leaves, or birds chirping always brought me a sense of freedom belonging, and peace.
How can I not fall for nature's charm? These childhood experiences left me with unforgettable memories of nature. They further inspire me to explore, appreciate, and preserve nature. At college, I joined several environmental organizations. I took part in environmental campaigns to tackle climate change and promote sustainability. I want to inspire more people around me and worldwide to participate in such an unprecedented undertaking. I want to broadcast one important message: we, as a group, can address the climate crisis. We can, and we will, leave a sound environment for future generations. That was Lily Russian and Horace Mo. Next month, Karina Taylor will share her introduction with you. Our good news story today comes from Lila Powell, a recent Citizens Climate Radio team member. Hi everyone, I'm Lila Powell, and I'm back with a good news story. For this month's story, I wanted to highlight a group who's been making great strides in environmental inclusion. Shelterwood Collective is a nonprofit that's bringing together those who have been excluded from environmentalism. The group are stewards of 900 acres of land in Northern California. It's an indigenous, black, and queer-led community forest, and it's maintained by a collective of land protectors and cultural change makers. Shelterwood's vision is to restore the relationship between and within people and nature. They focus on ecosystem restoration and community healing. They accomplish this through forest restoration and cultural strategy and art. The forest restoration draws from indigenous cultural and agricultural practices. These practices include controlled burns, invasive species removal, and erosion control. The community forest is located on unceded Kashia and Southern Pomo territory. Shelterwood draws on Kashia and Pomo techniques and wisdom through ongoing partnerships. And in 2022, they received a 4.5 million dollar grant. These funds are going towards continuing and expanding the forest restoration. Their cultural strategy and use of art aims to inspire others to get involved. These underrepresented artists focus on illustrating the environment as an interconnected ecosystem. And Shelterwood is also working on a new project, building a community and retreat center. This will be a place where social change leaders can strengthen the relationship with the environment and learn about inclusivity in environmental work. If you'd like to learn more about Shelterwood Collective's mission and projects, visit shelterwoodcollective.org. That's shelterwoodcollective.org. Thank you so much, Lila, for coming back with this good news story. If you have good news you want to share on the show, please email us radio at citizensclimate.org. That's radio at citizensclimate.org. If you are looking for more good news and you want to connect with other climate advocates who refuse to give up, then check out Grassroots Rising: Leveling Up in the Climate Fight. This is CCL's Fall Virtual Conference, November fourth through fifth, twenty twenty-three. You will hear speakers like CNN correspondent and author Van Jones. Plus, there's a special plenary presentation by our very own Dana Nucitelli, host of the Nerd Corner. For more information and free registration, visit cclusa.org/fallconference. That's cclusa.org/fallconference. This episode of Citizens Climate Radio was written and produced by me, Peter Santoscano. Other technical support from Ricky Bradley and Brett Cease. Social media assistance from Flannery Winchester. And as always, moral support from Madeline Perra. This month, Madeline retired from CCL. She envisioned many of the important programs that are successful today. She, along with Ricky Bradley, first approached me to create this show, Citizens Climate Radio. In that first conversation with Madeline, she stressed how much climate advocates need encouragement with the hard work we're doing. She also told me we need to be reminded that we can take on big issues and opposition to our work while remaining thankful and respectful. Thank you, Madeline, for all of your work. It will echo on and on for a long, long time.
let's hold on tight Found what we're looking for in life Call us crazy, but things are finally right With you and I, the future is bright 